Professor Dave Sears in economics suffers from a number of flaws in scientific reasoning, which tarnish their educational validity. Watch until the end if you want a proper understanding of the science of economics. First, we must understand the specific epistemological status of economics in a priori as opposed to an a posteriori science. To demonstrate, consider the statement, children prefer McDonald's to Burger King. If we are scientists and we are trying to determine the truth value of this statement, we notice that its negation children prefer Burger King to McDonald's, is also perfectly reasonable to assert. Therefore, if we want to know which one is true, we have to actually go out there and find out which one is true. We do not know beforehand, based entirely on the structure of logic. On the other hand, consider the statement ex ante, there is mutual profit in any voluntary trade. What is the negation of this statement? It would be ex ante, there is not mutual profit in any voluntary trade, which means that at least one party to the trade ended up with something he values less than what he gave up. But this makes absolutely no sense, for why would anyone agree to a course of action that leaves them lower on their scale of utility? Such a thing is an absurdity. Therefore, we know beforehand, i.e. a priori, the truth value of the above statement. That ex ante, there is mutual profit in any voluntary trade, as the negation of this statement is a falsehood, and the negation of a falsehood is a truth. We know before doing any sort of testing that this statement has to be true. Economics is built entirely on deductions from these incontrovertible, apodictic truths. Dave does make a nod to this in his initial video on the topic, saying that economics all boils down to choice. This is entirely true. Economics is a subscience of the general science of human action, known as praxeology. Choice is a core concept in praxeology, as it is how a man demonstrates his preferences, and thus his values. In short, action is defined as purposeful behaviour. It is the implementation of scarce means towards the attainment of some end. In Epistemological Problems of Economics, Mises demonstrates that, in distinct contrast to natural sciences, it is not based on observation or any other information gathered through the human senses. It relies on insights about certain structural features of human action, such as the fact that human beings make choices or that they use self-chosen means to attain self-chosen ends. The validity of economic theory does therefore not stand and fall with empirical investigations. Rather, economic laws are a priori laws that cannot be confirmed or refuted by the methods predominant in the natural sciences. This concept is explained in more depth in this video by MRH Legacy. For now though, I must turn my attention to Dave's first serious misunderstanding demonstrated in his video on prices in a free market. He correctly states that free markets are more efficient at allocating scarce means, but incorrectly states that there are exemptions to this rule. First, he cites imperfect competition as an instance where free markets are not the most efficient implying that central planning would more efficiently allocate scarce means in areas where there is imperfect competition. Imperfect competition here means that there are not enough groups in competition with each other to reach the equilibrium price, which is the first problem here. Equilibrium analyses are to be used only as a mental tool in aiding the comprehension of challenging theory. The equilibrium point is the point towards which the market will tend. This does not imply that there has been any ethical failing in not being at equilibrium though. As economists, we must simply analyse the market as it is is, not as we wish it to be. After all, to imagine a market at true equilibrium is to do just that. Imagine. Such a market would not reflect real world conditions at all. It would be a so-called evenly rotating economy. This imaginary construct relies on the assumption that value scales, technological ideas, given resources, time preferences, etc. all remain constant, which definitely does not reflect real world conditions. All of these things are constantly changing for every man. As Rothbard puts it, prior to the effects of any change being fully realised in the economy, other changes further intervene. The crucial point here being that to most efficiently react to all of these changing variables, we require a free market. Any interference by state aggression will necessarily be less efficient at doing so. After all, if a handful of firms competing in a market react to these changes slower than a far greater number, surely a single monopolist, the state, would react even slower than they do. Dave fails to demonstrate that in cases of some arbitrarily limited number of producers, the free market is less efficient than the alternative. Therefore, a thesis that there are exceptions to the idea that free markets lead to an efficient distribution of resources has yet to be demonstrated. It is surely perverse to state such a thing if free markets provide for the most efficient distribution in such an event. Professor Dave further goes on to state that when companies charge too high a price for goods and services, this is an example of price gouging, especially when supplies are limited. But earlier in the video he states, correctly, that prices go up as a result of shortages. 
he attempts to have it both ways, acknowledging both that rising prices are a signal to consumers to consume less of a good in relatively limited supply, and that this is some sort of nefarious thing. So which is it? Is it a natural and desirable signal to use less of something in limited supply, or is it the work of evil capitalists attempting to gouge suckers out of their hard-earned cash? Furthermore, who is to say that any given price is too high in a free market? The only instance I can think of when it is appropriate to say that a given price is too high is when comparing the price of a good in a hampered market to what it would be in an unhampered market. In other words, to say that a price is too high is to say that it is higher than what the free market would produce. Dave must properly explain what it means for a price in a free market to be too high, if he is speaking as an economist here. But maybe he is not saying this as an economist, but rather as an ethical theorist. Perhaps he is saying that while the price did arise naturally as a signal to consume less, such a rising of prices is bad for society, or a mean thing that shouldn't be done. To say this is to state the anti-human altruist ethic, that one should give away means to others in exchange for less money than they could potentially get, for no reason other than the pursuit of some unknown kumbaya-like higher purpose. Why exactly should this altruism go in the direction of the producer to consumer? Why not shake our heads at the consumer for not paying a far greater price than they could pay? Perhaps this is instead anger at anyone who makes trades which are not at the equilibrium price, rather than anger at anyone who does not trade for less than they expect they could. I have explained above why this understanding of equilibrium is unscientific for the economist, but it is also unscientific for the ethical theorist. This is a failure borrowed, I suspect from the public choice school, that any time the market is not in this never never land of equilibrium, some ethical failing has occurred, and thus the government ought to step in and force the market into equilibrium via aggressive interference. This anti-private property ethic is falsified on the grounds of its very proposal, however. When men engage in argumentation, they implicitly presuppose the norm of non-aggression, which implies that any explicit proposition of a pro-aggression norm is false via the law of non-contradiction. They are in effect proposed non-aggression and aggression, the prior being the negation of the latter. However, if I have misunderstood this, and Dave is not seeing any state other than equilibrium as an unethical state of affairs, then he should explicitly state what ethic he is using, rather than forcing the viewer to guess at it in this manner. And he certainly should not be intermingling covert ethics like this into a video on economics. Next, we turn back from ethics to economics in analysing Dave's misunderstanding of the economic effects of inflation. In his video on the topic, he asserts that a small amount of inflation, 2-3%, to is good because it encourages investment and thus promotes economic growth, saying that people are more likely to invest in capital if they know that prices will go up. What this ignores is that inflation in the form of fraudulently created false credit invariably drives the business cycle. This is because creating new credit like this reduces the cost of borrowing, which signals to investors that people have set aside more resources for investment, so they should therefore invest differently than they otherwise would have. Instead of relatively short-run projects, they will invest in relatively long-run projects in an attempt to match what they believe is the time preferences of consumers. These investments are not the correct investments though, as they originate from aggressive interference into the market, as opposed to reflecting the actual desires of men. Therefore, these clustered malinvestments will eventually slam up against the reality that consumers did not want these projects. The boom will turn to bust as people try reallocating means back where they should be. All in all, there will have been a massive destruction of potential wealth compared to if the fraudulent credit had never been introduced. To make this easier to understand, I brought an analogy from Jonathan Newman. Imagine Robinson Crusoe is on a desert island, and he has a number of projects that he's been investing in. Maybe the roof of his shack is leaky and he's collecting up some wood to fix it. Maybe he has been forming reeds into nets to increase his supply of fish, and so on and so forth. But one morning he wakes up and sees some colourful mushrooms growing outside. He decides to eat these mushrooms and they cause him to hallucinate in a very specific way. He perceives his stockpile of resources to be far greater than what they actually are. He thinks, Wow, I did not know that I had saved so much. What would be the effect of this hallucination? Well, he would invest in different projects than he would otherwise. Instead of trying to repair his leaky roof, perhaps he decides he can build a brand new, far better shelter. Instead of making a simple net, he sees enough resources to make an entire fishing trawler, and he thinks he can invest in all of these far longer run projects, only because he thinks he has far greater savings at his disposal than he actually does. When the mushrooms wear off, he will recognise that these projects were not the right course of action. They were far too long run given the amount of resources actually at his disposal. What is the solution to this predicament? The Austrians would say they must face his bust like a man, 
pull up his bootstraps and try and salvage what he can from his malinvestments. The Keynesians would rather say that he simply must eat more mushrooms to get another boom going. I think it is clear which solution will actually further Crusoe's standard of living. Furthermore, inflation cannot raise the general standard of living, as it is not creating any new wealth. Rather, it is a redistribution of wealth away from one class who did not receive the new funds towards those who did receive the new funds. This is, in effect, a covert theft, sapping the wealth of savers in favour of borrowers, theft being something that is to be opposed on the grounds of it being a rights violation. Now Dave's adherence to public goods theory must be systematically attacked. Essentially, the theory goes that while the free market is the most efficient tool allocating most scarce goods, there exists a special class of public goods that are exempted from this law. These goods, proponents say, are better provided via state central planning, rather than being left to the machinations of the free market. Market. But here I shall borrow from Hans Hermann Hoppe in demonstrating that no such goods exist. In spite of its many followers, the whole public goods theory is faulty, flashy reasoning riddled with internal inconsistencies, non sequiturs, appealing to and playing on popular prejudices and assumed beliefs, but with no scientific merit whatsoever. It is argued by public goods theorists that the enjoyment of certain goods cannot be limited to only those who have financed their production, that other random people also receive benefits from them, making them public as opposed to private goods, whose enjoyment is strictly limited to those who actually pay for them. It is argued that because of this unique attribute, a market cannot produce these goods efficiently. Hopper points out that the exact classification of which goods count as public goods varies widely from author to author, making it challenging to find a good which is widely regarded as public. This should be of no surprise, because the entire starting point of the theory, the above algorithm which reportedly classifies public as opposed to private goods, is entirely flawed. Literally any good one could imagine may be perceived by others as being beneficial or detrimental to their lives. Take the example of a man wearing yellow socks. I cannot imagine any public goods theorist has classified these yellow socks as anything but a private good, but it is possible that another man may see these yellow socks and be thrilled by them. He may have spent years of his life searching for someone wearing yellow socks. This may well be something that he perceives to be the greatest day of his life so far. Now, it is clear that the sock witnesser has benefited from the wearing of the socks by the sock wearer, implying that these yellow socks were a public good. So really, a consistent public goods theorist who recognises the truth of subjective value would class literally every good as a public good. We have gone from an attempt at having one's socialist cake and eating it also, right back hip deep into complete socialist central planning of the economy. But what if one decides that they do in fact want to be such a consistent public goods theorist? There still exists a severe theoretic issue. I can just as easily imagine a separate man who absolutely hates to see yellow socks and thus sees this as a public bad. We notice that we cannot simply classify anything as a universal public good or bad, as it is entirely subjective whether a given thing improves or detracts from one's standard of living. If the state ought to step in to produce public goods because the free market cannot do so, surely it should not step in for public bads, or perhaps it should step in to make sure that such public bads do not occur. It is unclear which path the public goods theorists will choose to take. Say the state should not step in, leaving it to the market. We are left in contradiction that every good ought to be provided by the free market, and it ought not be provided by the free market, as every good can be both a public good and a public bad. Okay, but what if the state should step in to make sure that the public bad isn't produced? Still, we face the same contradiction. Any good can be both a public good and a public bad, meaning the state should both ensure its production and ensure it is not produced. Dave does seem to detract somewhat from this standard classification system found in the public goods literature, instead giving the following criteria to determine whether a given good should be treated as a public good, yet again demonstrating his intermingling of ethics with the value-free science of economics. 1. Is the individual benefit greater if the good remains private? And 2. Is the benefit to society greater if the good becomes public? As for criterion 1, individuals will receive goods far more efficiently under private production. And furthermore, such a private production cannot involve any aggression. Aggression being something that they aggressed upon, by definition, would prefer did not occur. Criterion 2 falls on the grounds of being an interpersonal comparison of utility. 
which is impossible to perform. This is because utility is ordinal and subjective. It is simply the ranking of various different states of the world by acting man. To demonstrate why we can't compare these, imagine two foot races are ran, but the only thing that is recorded in each race is the order in which each race are finished. It would be absurd to imagine that given this information, one would be able to determine who was fastest overall. All you can do is say the order of the racers in each individual race. The same goes for utility. It is an absurdity to suggest anything like John values one beer more, less, or the same as Mark does. Such an assertion would not derive from apodictic truths in the science of human action, and as such would be unscientific. Therefore, it is impossible to say that policy X would be of greater benefit to society than policy Y. Methodological individualism must be implemented in the analysis of policies like this, rather than Dave's methodological collectivism. Without providing a scientific explanation of what he means by benefit to society, he cannot escape this hole and we are forced to assume he is referring to some manner of societal utility. Dave continues the series with an episode on the minimum wage, among other things. Here, he asserts that there is some unsighted evidence that raising the minimum wage can create wealth which ripples through society and that it can therefore raise the general standard of living. The use of the term evidence signals the astute viewer that Dave is fumbling into considering economics as an a posteriori science, which I explained above was epistemologically flawed. Further, if it was the case that minimum wage really does raise the standard of living and create new wealth, why on earth would we limit ourselves? Why not set it at $1 million per hour? Why not $10 million? or a hundred million, or set it to be equivalent to more gold than exists in the observable universe. We remind ourselves that notes are money only in so far as they represent actual scarce commodities. If the minimum wage can create wealth, it should be able to do this even under a 100% gold standard. But we witness that literally nobody could hope to pay this minimum wage, as nobody possesses this much gold. This allows us to recognise a minimum wage not as a tide which rises all ships, but as a hurdle over which people must jump to attain employment. On a free market, there is no such thing as involuntary unemployment, but in a hampered market with a minimum wage, there may exist people who can only produce less than the minimum wage, who thus cannot find work. Employers would love to hire them, they would love to be hired, but they are being prevented from engaging in this mutually beneficial arrangement. In a later video, and the video that tipped me off this series, Dave states four disadvantages to the free markets over the alternative. The first being the fear over the formation of natural monopolies in industries with high startup costs. This fear is simply absurd on its face, as if monopolization, i.e. the prevention of competition, is something to be concerned about. How exactly is it that the solution to this problem is to bring in coercive state monopolization? If a free market is characterised by free entry into a given industry, then the negation of a free market must be characterised by not having this free entry. We have a contradiction that monopolies are bad so we should have a monopoly which prevents monopolies. Furthermore, Rothbard demonstrates in Man, Economy and State that a monopoly can only come about as a result of a state monopoly grant. Dave's second disadvantage is that on a free market there will be fewer public goods and services, which I have already addressed above, so I shall move on to his third, that free markets have instances of negative externalities. On this point, Dave cites pollution which is a natural law tort. If I run a factory and I pump out suit that dirty as your shirt is drying outside, I have trespassed that suit onto your clothes, thus damaging them. This, being a natural crime, would not exist in a free market, but rather it is a hampering force on the market. And in fact, such instances of pollution were dealt with in courts up until the US federal government wanted to up production and compete with the UK. To do this, they formed the EPA and handed out pollution licenses. The courts, monopolised by the state, then stopped helping out the people who were trespassed upon by pollutants, a distinctly non-free market characteristic. Finally, Dave points to corner cutting as a disadvantage over central planning. First, he does not provide any demonstration that products produced by a central planner will be in any way of greater quality, and he ignores that a consumer may want to purchase a product whose production cuts corners. Imagine I want a ruler to draw straight lines. All I care about is that this ruler can indeed draw a sufficiently straight line and I find one that does just that. But then Dave comes along with his fancier ruler that was made to be phenomenally accurate in his measuring of lengths and says, wait, 
Zulu, your ruler's divisions are off by a few millimetres each. You don't want that ruler. Get the one which is twice the price, with all sorts of extra gizmos and features. I would clearly respond by informing him that I do not care how accurately he measures distances. I just want it to draw a line straight enough for the task at hand. And my cheaper ruler does just that. It benefits me that the people who made my ruler did cut corners in not being super precise with their divisions, and not including the extra features that I do not desire, as this corner cutting allowed them to to produce a ruler for cheaper. In his video on mixed economies, some of the above flaws become more apparent and less covert. Dave states that certain needs cannot be met by a free market, citing highway systems and military. However, he does not provide any arguments as to why these goods, insofar as they are goods, could not be provided by a free market. Let's take highways. What is the good being provided by a road? Bearing in mind that goods versus bads are subjective and a man might want to build a road just because he thinks it looks pretty. What I think Dave is getting at here is the good of transportation, but why should we expect that transportation cannot be provided by a free market? Take the counter example of a man building a toll road across his farm, or a man constructing a helicopter to take people between landing pads, or a rural farmer purchasing a boat to transport his crops down the river. These counter examples demonstrate the falsehood of the principle that a free market cannot provide transport. Unless of course Dave is saying that it's physically impossible for a man to build a boat or construct a road without engaging in crime, but he must first demonstrate that this is the case, rather than simply asserting it. Now we move to military. A military does many things. If a military is simply to mean the enforcement arm of the state over foreigners, then the military is not a good, but rather a bad. It is a group of gun-toting criminals used by the state to murder and tax people into submission. If, on the other hand, the military is to be taken as rights enforcement, Dave must demonstrate why a free market cannot enforce rights. Furthermore, we have a contradiction, that rights can only be enforced by a violation of rights. Therefore, Dave's second example also falls flat. This point is related to a later point in the video where he asserts that government is required to protect private property rights. This is a contradiction. It is not the protection of property rights to engage in crime. Crime is specifically the negation of the respect for property rights. He makes a further failing on this point by lumping in genuine property rights with so-called intellectual property. Property can only exist where there is scarcity, as it is only where there is scarcity that conflict is possible, and thus property norms arise. Ideas are not scarce two men can use the exact same idea at the exact same time. It is not possible to have a conflict over an idea, therefore there is no such thing as property rights over ideas. Rather, these so-called rights are in fact crimes, in excluding others from using an idea to act with only their own property. I do have one final point. Debate me, Dave. If you stand by the points made in your series, then answer these criticisms. I did try to raise them in the comments of one of the videos, but either YouTube started hiding my comments, or you or one of your moderators did it. I was recording a regular old sign off to the video where I raised the suspicion that perhaps there was comment meddling afoot, but I forwarded with the possibility that YouTube itself was removing the comments, which is something I have experienced myself, but then something strange happened. I decided to get screenshots of my comment thread to use as b-roll for this section, and I went to archive the thread for posterity, and I noticed that the archiver didn't seem to see the thread, even though I linked directly to it. I asked some people in my discord whether they were able to access this thread, and they told me that they could not. This is very strange activity, if this was YouTube auto-sending my comments straight into oblivion, why did it keep the thread up long enough for many people, including Dave, to reply to it? Why only hide the thread after potentially two months of inactivity? And also, why were my comments suggesting that Dave debates me on stream instantly hidden? This doesn't make much sense. You can see in the background footage here that I'm on the page that links directly to my comment thread. I can see it on YouTube, but not on an archived page. I refresh each page to demonstrate that I'm doing no inspect element trickery. This is not activity that I have ever witnessed YouTube take of its own volition. If a comment is deemed spam or contains a banned word, it is not displayed to the public. Keeping the thread up for so long only to hide it from others does not strike me as automatic action. I left an entirely innocuous comment under his most recent episode, and it too cannot be seen by the archiver, or the people on my discord. Also, before you accuse the archiving site of being unable to record any highlighted comment, I have here a working archive of a different user's comment. I am only unable to archive my own comments, implying that it is only my comments that are being blocked from public viewing. I ask that Dave confirm whether he is hiding my comments, or whether this is some sort of unknown to me YouTube bug. In any case, back to the video. 
Then again, it is unfair to focus all of this criticism squarely at Dave. It is his channel, so he does deserve some of the blame for muddying economics education, but he didn't write the scripts to any of the episodes, rather a jarvist by the name of Mr. Beat did. So I extend this challenge also to him, and anyone else who stands by any of Dave's points. And on the topic of Georgism, if you want to see my destruction of that ideology, you have to watch this video, where I do just that. He doesn't understand economics, Professor Dave explains.